Hello, my name is Sharon Azrielli. Welcome to my series, Canadian by Design, where I speak with fabulous Canadian architects, designers, and artists about their passions and what makes them tick. In February of 2020, so lucky, I had just healed from my broken leg right before COVID. I was lucky enough to meet with amazing designer Tiffany Pratt. I hobbled up the stairs of her cozy, full floor apartment in the Beaches neighborhood of Toronto. Tiffany talks a lot about her apartment and how she doesn't want a large apartment. She wanted a small apartment, but location, of course, is paramount. I mean, the place is uh, not a large apartment. It's the top of uh, uh, those row houses, uh, but it's, you know, literally you can throw a stone at the, uh, at the lake. So it's a fabulous location. And uh, she lives alone, so she says she doesn't need a large place. But every square inch of the place is cram-packed with what makes Tiffany, Tiffany. So you have colors everywhere. You have found objects that are recycled everywhere. And you have the handcrafted objects that Tiffany makes. Every square inch. Tiffany is not only a fascinating human being, she's a great storyteller. I know that you will enjoy her interview as much as I had a marvelous time interviewing her. Tiffany Pratt, I am so thrilled to have you at Home in Canada. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are here today at Tiffany Pratt's home in Toronto, on the bord du lac <laughs> and it's gorgeous it's a humble little place down by the lake here in toronto um it's filled with my artifacts and things that i love uh, it's it just keeps the machine pumping so thank you for coming thank you so much and try and get a shot of little poppy poppy sleeping in my lap poppy's well she just woke up yep and she's the most delicious and velvety creature and she's <laughs> beautiful so thank you for letting us oh, have poppy true pleasure it's fabulous. Everywhere I look, I see Tiffany Pratt and things that are important to you. Yes. Yeah. And you'll see there's no TV in here. True. You I, know, there's yeah. no TV in here. Uh, there's a lot of things in here that are about um, just keeping your spirit strong, keeping creativity at the forefront and making sure that color is always king. I love uh, all the colors in Tiffany's home because it reminds me of my own house. Um, my dining room is orange, my library is teal, my bedroom is Tiffany blue. Um, and uh, I think that that's what makes you happy when you walk into a house and you are not beige and gray. You know, Canada especially is a harsh country, especially in wintertime. And you don't want to be reminded of you know, the gray days and the snow outside. You want to come home and be embraced in a warm color and reminded of sunshine. And uh, we don't get that outside. We need to have it inside. And every space is used. Well, when you're, when you're a designer or when you are um, in a small space, I chose to live in a small space because it's just me. And I've lived in bigger homes, but I don't feel as cozy or at home in bigger spaces. And so when you do live in tighter quarters, you want to make sure that you use every part of it. And the home needs to develop over time. I've been here for a long time, so I've been able to slowly develop where I want things to be and how I want to live in the space. I agree with Tiffany that you need to take advantage of every space. You know, not everybody can have a large house. And Tiffany chose to have a small house. You need to not only take advantage of every space visually, but you need to plan ahead and take advantage of every space for storage, 
take advantage of every space for usability. And sometimes a designer is the only person that can see with outside eyes what you miss. A lot of people don't realize that you can use furniture for storage. You don't have to let everybody see all your mess. Um, but more than the space itself, it was the building and the location. Fabulous location. You know, you don't necessarily get excited about the facade of the space, but when you're inside, it feels like you've been transported. And, it, you know, being down by the lake is, is the most important thing for me. Yeah. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Yep. Sometimes you don't know what to expect when you're meeting a huge celebrity that's on television everywhere, that has all these books published, and and that has pink hair, and that is so lar larger than life. So uh, my first impression meeting Tiffany was that it she was uh, surprisingly down to earth and normal. I mean, you know, everybody is a character and so am I. But here she was and she had her tiny little dog, you know, sleeping in her lap. And she was really very sweet and, uh, and kind. What I want to talk about uh, first as we go along, I love to talk a little bit chronologically. Great. And so first what I want to talk about is your beginnings. Yes. And so I know that you started out um, working for your dad. I wasn't with my dad. My mom and my dad um, were only together for a short period because my dad actually passed away when I was seven. Oh, but he I'm so sorry. did have an auction house. Okay. And he did, um, he was buying and selling, and lots of things at the time were with cattle and horses and automobiles. Okay. So that was very much his business. Okay. Um, and my mom was a stay at home mom. Okay. And then when she passed, this is where I get my female get up and go. Okay. She pulled up her bootstraps. She had three girls and she took on whatever job she could. She sold real estate. She, she cooked meals. She cleaned houses. She sang songs. My mom is, is the ultimate in a woman just making it happen. Fabulous. Yeah. She's a creator and, um, she just taught us to know who we are and go after what was important to our, to us. That's wonderful. And we're all very different, my sisters and myself, but, um, I had a shining example of a woman who literally took charge of her life and needed to figure it out. So that's been my role model, and that's how I've done what I've done, is just taking charge of my dreams and figuring it out. So tell me more. Where, tell me more about how you got started. Well, I, you learn, I think, when you're quiet with yourself and you're not busy with distractions, you have an opportunity to understand what makes you happy. And at a really young age, I knew color made me happy. I was always painting. I was always moving things around. I was always making stuff. Um, because my mom is a creative person, we always had paints in the house and sewing machines. And um, I, she just always let me play. Uh, I was never interested in television. I wasn't interested in what my friends were. I did a lot of alone time. I read a lot of books. And right out of the gate, as soon as I was an adult that could make a decision, I knew I would be a part of the design world. Because... I, I remember watching fashion television. You remember Jeannie Becker? Fashion television, first episode I watched, I was like, this is me. I'm a creative person. Once I started researching uh, Tiffany's work, I was excited to meet her because I think that anybody that encourages recycling, encourages not spending crazy money on uh, buying, you know, outrageously priced objects that encourages actually putting the power of design into everybody's hands is to be commended. And tell tell us where did you tell us where you went to school? Tell us sure. So I I watched Jeannie Becker on fashion television, and at that moment I was like, I am going to be a fashion designer. I am going to be in fashion. So I actually moved to Australia, lived there for a while. And when I came home, I moved to New York City and I walked all of my paintings that I had done right up to the to FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology. Okay. And they said, you are absolutely not a fashion designer. You will hate it. You are not a technical creator, but you will be um, enrolled on the spot for textile and surface design. Oh, fascinating. So at the time, I didn't understand textiles. I didn't understand surface design. Um, but I did know I had elective courses and I had studio time. Okay. So I accepted the enrollment and I started in right away with um, art histories and psychologies and I did all my elective courses first. And then I was traveling back and forth because I met somebody who lived in Connecticut. So I'm traveling back and forth on the train from Connecticut to New York 
and I was wearing a vintage $25 houndstooth gold button swing coat. I used to do that too, Salvation yes. Army. That's the only place I shopped. I had no cash. <laughs> <laughs> and I, all I knew is I knew it looked good. And I saw this coat and it had the, you know, the three quarter length sleeve. Right. I and love it. And I had that. a little bob at the time and the big right. pearl earrings. Right. And this woman stopped me on the train and she said, you have style and I don't know what you do for a living, but I would love for you to um, work at the Fifth Avenue Club. I love this about Tiffany. And I agree with her so much. And I said this to her, my entire house is from, well, I started out by going to, Salvation Army and consignment stores and all of this. And then, as you know, you have a little bit of money. The most fun is to go to auctions. I remember when I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, I, I got the best pieces. You wait till or you go early or you wait till everybody goes home and nobody's bidding. I got the best pieces for like 50 bucks. And I still have them to this day because now they're antiques. Ah. It's true. It's 100% true. Or in some neighborhoods, people throw away. I have six dining room chairs that were on the street in New York City, and I paid a taxi driver $20 to get them home. <laughs> and the Fifth Avenue Club is the personal shopping club at Saks Fifth Avenue. Oh. So I said yes. So I never turned back. I never finished school. I never went to school. I dropped my elective courses. I had an office at Saks. Wow. And I started to shop for people. Okay. So that is where it all began for me, okay. was working in clothing, understanding in New York City how things were bought and sold, um, understanding designers, trunk shows, how to fit clothes, putting things together. And as I was growing as a person, I kept wanting more. So when I was tired of dressing people, I started to work um, for a man who had a hair care product that was sold through Saks. Okay. And I developed his hair care line and I got him in all the different stores and started to work in product. Okay. So I'm now developing a hair care line and branding this. And then I, I'm running his business at 25. Fabulous. I'm running a man's business at 25. He's got a staff of 25 below us running two salons. I'm developing what this hair care line's about. We're making brushes in Italy. Um, but then I realized I've taken this like business approach. I've been hustling the streets of New York. I've been working in hair care. I've been back and forth from New York to Connecticut for years. Um, and I really missed making. I was always painting on the side. I was always reupholstering things. I was always painting walls and messing with stuff at the house. Um, not knowing that that's what I really love. So Great. I started to, um, we bought an old house which was from 1910. With It was a center hall colonial, and we started to renovate it. And here we are. So picture me, 25. It was a 4,000-square-foot house. We used to start ripping it apart. And I had obviously no experience doing this. He had no experience doing this. And he's giving it all to me because I'm the girl, and I've got the style. So this is how it begins. Every great designer that I have spoken to has a lexicon. And right. I noticed that you have created one yes. as well. And it has the word maker in it. And I'm yeah. like, what is a maker? Yeah. So please. I love, and I've taken the word maker into my lexicon because I, I'm sick of the DIY term because DIY harkens someone back to the thoughts of grandma and crocheting and knitting and Craft. crafting. And I don't believe it's about crafting, but I believe in the power of our own two hands. Okay. And long before the days of YouTube and all the things that we've done to be a part of a DIY or a maker's crowd, I had to figure it out. I was working on this house by myself, painting walls, reupholstering, hanging drapes, hanging wallpaper, spackling, like you name it. And I had to figure it out. And I didn't, we didn't have all the money in the world to hire people indefinitely to do it all. Okay. And I love to make. So I use the word maker because when I get hired to work on a space, if I'm working on a set, if I'm working on a job, if I'm creative directing, it doesn't matter what I take on. I always know and people always know that there's a handmade touch. I'm not going to have everything made perfect. There's always going to be something that I've painted, a piece of art that I've made, a uh, chair that I've painted out, something that I've salvaged, something that we've made together, something that's been put together. The maker is someone that celebrates the handmade, or the maker is someone that celebrates the use of their own two hands when assembling something. 
Oh, so that's interesting. So a maker uh, encompasses the idea that you're going to make it together with the client. And if it's physical, if it's emotional, but for me, I'm making. We're not just assembling. We are creating something and together. So, and do you explain that to the client when you uh, when you take on a new client that that's I don't know, have part to, of that lexicon? Sometimes they'll learn it with me over time. You know, I, I in early days, um, people appreciated that about me because that means I'm thrifty. That means I'm not going to spend all your money mm -hmm. doing all of this incredibly custom stuff. Uh -huh. um, and so I developed a big clientele with my craftiness in the form of I'm going to get this, I'm going to add this, I'm going to upholster that, I'm going to paint this. I'm going to use something that you already have. You're not going to throw everything out. You're going to find something on the street. Yeah, which and I'm I've gonna, seen. And right. I'm going to make it work. Mm -hmm. So a maker is not someone that's afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of designers don't love that. A lot of designers don't want to necessarily... No, which is what I, right, I totally love that about you. Right? Yeah. I absolutely agree with Tiffany that we must find value in everything. Like I used to love when I had no money uh, buying clothing at the Salvation Army. And um, I, still, I still do. I actually met one of my teachers at school at Village des Valeurs in Montreal and we were like you can find the best things there you know I love consignment stores still I still buy um, dishes you know at a state sale and I never understand why you have to buy anything new I, I, I even had this conversation I hope you've all seen the interview with Mike Holmes by now and I had an argument with him about why should we build new houses? Isn't it better for the environment to take an old house, you know, and fix it up? Because I still believe, you know, that it's better to find value in something that was already built and make it right. That's a Holmes term. They don't want to put their hands in on it. They don't mm -hmm. want to tear something apart. They don't want to put the tiling in. They don't want to paint the floors. Mm -hmm. One of my very, very, very first gigs here in Toronto was a condo that I did with my with my own two hands by myself. Painted out the kitchen, ripped up the floors, I saw it. I just epoxied it. Yep. the floors, Loved it. made the headboard out of a, a piece the, of... It, out of the batten. And that's the, right. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. But when you learn how to create and make, you have greater power as your projects get larger because you can understand the tradesmen mm -hmm. and you can tell them how things are done you can explain things with authority. You can come at it from an approach of having done it yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not just some diva that's pointing your finger in your high heels telling them what to do. Yep. So I've always been the person that will show up to the job site in my work boots, ready to go, ready to work, ready to tear something apart, ready to learn. Beautiful. So here's the thing that I loved about you so much and that I thought, okay, here's the crux of this article. Okay. Recycling. Yes. And it's so important. It is. Now more than ever. And basically what you're brilliant at and what you have made into an art is recycling. You're taking it to the next level where it should be. I've never believed it, there was ever a bad time to use what we had. Absolutely. And that I did not come from lots of cash where I felt like I had the ability to waste what I had. I wasn't in a place where it was squalor, but I knew that everything had to be repurposed in order to look like there was more. I had to learn how to style my outfits so I looked like I had more clothes. I had to learn how to rearrange my room in different ways with the same furniture. The creative mind only ever knows how to use what it has. You can't expect as a creative person that you'll only ever have all the cash to do all the things you'll ever want to do. That's part of the thriftiness and the brilliance of being creative is to use what you have. And I've only ever been so sensitive about the planet since I was a little girl. I don't know why, but it's always, um, it's always hit me how valuable the resources have been. And I remember being the president of the Pollution Solution Club in, in like elementary school. And I cleaned the garbage off the, the, the schoolyard. But the punchline is I've only, I love reusing my clothes. I love buying salvage. I love buying vintage clothes. I love finding value in things that people don't find value in. I love using something for something else. I love understanding that there's a history to what we already have. 
I love showing people their own things back to themselves in a new way. I love integrating stories of things past in a super styled environment where people would never have imagined this piece of paper or this piece of art or something. So it's actually been something it comes from love. It comes from my love of, of showing people what's possible with things like detritus or trash, what people would never consider glamorous and to show them that it can be. It's fabulous. So um, it is a timely message, but it's always been my message. And, I've, and that's the one thing about branding and personalities and when you become something is you have to think about that before things get popular, before your name becomes anything. Who are you? What do you stand for? What's important to you? And what I always found was important to me, even when I had an art studio down the street, when I was teaching art, I use all recyclable materials. I was nominated for a Toronto Green Award. You use renewable energy. You have to be your message every day. It's not just for the public. It's not just for consumption in magazines. It's for every day. You have to activate the things that are important to you, even when the cameras aren't rolling, because that's what actually creates the difference. So I'm always on that. I'm always looking around. I'm always... It helps my creative mind stay fresh, is how can I take this forgotten thing or this thing that someone hates or this thing that no one will love or that fabric that no one will use and make it desirable? We should all be recycling, okay? Should we use recycled materials? If we can, you know, it depends. Some recycled materials will lend themselves well to... Like, for example, I don't know, I hope you all have seen or will see, and I'm not sure when it's coming out, my uh, interview with Karen Rashid. You know, Karen Rashid is one of the great industrial designers of all time, and he does try to use recycled materials in his uh, furniture. Whenever we can, absolutely, we should be using recycled materials. But what uh, Tiffany talks about is recycling materials. So, yes, we must. We have to start to be helpful, aware, save our planet. That is so well put and brilliant and right on. The chair you're sitting in. Yeah, bucks. exactly. Value Village. Yes. But by the way, my home too. Yeah. Everything came from either a secondhand store or I found it on the street. Yep. Even my carpets. Yep. People were throwing them away. Like, huh. what? But that's where I think when people come into this space, it's, and I call it humble, and it's because, like, that table was off the side of the street. And those spools of thread were given to me from a factory that was closing. Punchline, though, is that it's not about how much it costs, and it's not about where it comes from. It, it matters that you love it and that it speaks to you. Here, here. And that that's one thing that I think is important about assembly is that it's not precious, that you can actually live in your home, and that if something happens to it, you're not crying or upset. That's often what I try to preach when I'm assembling spaces for people with money or without is that you have to live in your home. It has to be functional. You have to have places to put things. It has to make sense. It has to be organized, but beautiful and still accessible where if you want to eat spaghetti cross-legged on your couch and you spill the sauce everywhere, who cares? Here, here. The thing that I uh, was the most impressed with Tiffany uh, is her cohesive uh, world view and understanding that you have to live your philosophy, you know, as she says, even when the camera is not on you. So if you are about, you know, using recycled materials and um, being with clients, knowing, for example, she talks about knowing the trades and knowing what you're talking about. She is that person, she's full of integrity, and she does what she does all the time. It's not an act that she uh, puts on just for the cameras. And I admire her very, very much. So when people come here and they know of me as they've, they've uh, you know, glamorized me as this whatever designer, yes, I am that designer. Yes, I can create those beautiful things for you. And yes, I have created many beautiful things, but I don't need to live like that because that's not who I am. And neither should they, right. because they have to live there too. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Thank you. That's fabulous. What is next for Tiffany Pratt? <laughs> what, because because I'll, I'll let me yeah, think. Yeah, uh, yeah, finish. Because um, what's brilliant about us, I do this too, 
we reinvent ourselves. Yes. So I'm waiting for the next iteration. Uh, maybe this is part and parcel or another compartmentalization because we were talking about that before. Yeah. What's next, um, I think, is always a con it's a connection between what comes and what um, inspires you. And so I've always, I've tired now of do doing residential design. I've done it for so many years and I've, you know, proven to myself and others time and again, um, my deep love for assembly and repurposing and creating beauty. Um, I want, I love larger scale projects now because they challenge me and I really love to be challenged. Um, and I'm never the type of person that likes to do anything for too long because it means that your work becomes stale. I do a lot of TV right now, and that's a fun challenge because the timelines are always so tight and, you know, the budgets are always so interesting and you meet new people all the time. So it's constantly reworking the creative brain. But um, one thing that I've always believed in, and I'm sure you can see when you look around my house, is the spirit behind why we do what we do. And that, I think, is part of what I've been talking about in my podcast called The Love Jam, what I preach in my book, This Can Be Beautiful, is that there's a spirit behind the creative process. And I always want to help people with that. So if it's through talks or if it's through my podcast or if it's another book um, or if it's creating a, a space where people can come, is that I want people to tap back into their creative spirit and own that about themselves and don't, not squish it down and not believe they have to be anything else but creative. Um, so I think that there's a spirit side to my work that's coming through because um, I think part of my work is being a guide for others to understand that, you know, if this crazy pink haired whack can do it, you can do it too. You know, I'm a, I'm a physical representation of everybody. You know, we are all the same. And I just want people to know that I never look at my work as it, it's about me. It's about all of us owning who we are and being comfortable in our own skin and being able to have a message or a creative message or creative idea or some sort of cool dream and we can all make it real. And so I want to help or teach or support anyone else in their creative journey as an artist, as a designer to do the same. In this next segment, this is one of the most beautiful things that Tiffany says in the whole interview and she impressed me so greatly. She talks about how she believes that everybody is creative in their own way. And I have to admit, it had never occurred to me, especially in the way that she describes it. And I'm so impressed with her. And I'm so impressed with her magnanimous spirit. I never thought that everybody is as creative as she gives them credit for. And listening to her opened my eyes and she really taught me something. That brings up a very interesting question and maybe I'm gonna ask a tough question. Now. That's okay. Because I had this discussion with Karim Rashid, for example. Great. And he, uh, so I'm gonna ask you this question. Do you believe actually that anybody can be creative? Yes. I don't even, there's not a shadow of a doubt in my mind. We are all creative beings, but how we see creativity is different. Some people see creativity with numbers. Some people see creativity through pictures. Some people see, through, see creativity through food. We all are creative people. We have a different outlet. Oh. It's unfortunate that we believe that creativity is just with the arts because it's not the truth. We're not just creative through music or conceptual or physical art musical that's not the case art is everywhere art is in our buildings art is everywhere how things are made it's all art we just have different faces we believe that we're not artists but everyone out there doing their work is an artist the focal point of the interview for tiffany and for me that she wanted to i think the uh, viewer would like to take away is color riotous color and how much color can bring to everybody's life. And I think it's so important, especially now, everybody should 
think about how to bring color into their lives, what, what uh, personal message color can bring, and also how can we uh, be creative in these times of, of darkness, both physically and what's going on in the world around us. And I think the beautiful thing about Tiffany is that she's helping everybody to be a little bit more creative in their lives and take a little bit more personal power to be creative, to learn how to be creative. And that's the beautiful thing about Tiffany. That's a beautiful answer. I love that answer. <laughs> Last question. Sure. How do you intend to give back? I think giving back is through the gift of time is we all have two hands and time. And that's where earlier we were talking about compartmentalizing. And by compartmentalizing, it's not just about what we're doing, but it's about how we're using our time. And I, I believe wholly that when you can give your time to something, yes, you can give resources. Resources are great, but time is important. So I'm always helping and figuring out a way to just give my time in any way I can. Um, last year was lots of time with Camp Ooch, and those are the children who go to camp who are um, suffering with cancer. So I did camp with them last year here in Toronto. Um, I'll go and I'll do career day. I went to Sick Kids and I actually made 50 boxes and did an art program with kids there. Um, you name it, if someone asks me and they need help, I'm a part of it and I want to help. And it's always got some sort of an artistic thread, but it's just those small moments and gestures of time where someone can just be with you and you can share the things that you know and you can create beauty together. Um, that's how you give back. And it could be someone on the street. It could be a friend. It could be someone in need. It can be a charity. It doesn't matter really what it is. It's just to give the gift of time because we're all so busy. But when you can express your love through the gift of your time, I think there's nothing greater than that. Thank you so much, Tiffany. It was amazing to meet you. And I learned so much. And thank you for opening your house to us. And it's just wonderful. You're just wonderful. <laughs> and thank you for coming and being uh, so open hearted and interested and willing to be with me. It's, thank a, you. it's a gift. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Sharon Azrielli with At Home in Canada and Canadian by Design. Thank you so much for joining me. It has been my pleasure to have you in my home in Canada with At Home in Canada. For more interviews, please be sure to check with us at athomeincanada.ca. All the best. <laughs>